Our first scripture this morning comes from the book of Leviticus, chapter 18, verses 21 through 22. You must not give any of your children to offer them over to Molech, so that you do not defile your God's name. I am the Lord. You must not have sexual intercourse with a man as you would with a woman. It is a detestable practice. And our second reading from the book of Romans, chapter 1, 26 and 27. That's why God abandoned them to degrading lust. Their females traded natural, natural sexual relations for unnatural. Also, in the same way, the males traded natural sexual relations with females and burned with lust for each other. Males performed shameful acts with males and they were paid back with the penalty they deserved for their mistake in their own bodies. Our gospel lesson for this morning comes, from, first lesson comes from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 6, verses 37 and 38. Jesus says, don't judge, and you won't be judged. Don't condemn, and you won't be condemned. Forgive, and you will be forgiven. Give, and it will be given to you, a good portion, packed down, firmly shaken, and overflowing, will fall into your lap. The portion you give will determine the portion you receive in return. And our second gospel reading from the Gospel of John, chapter 13, verses 34 through 35. On the last night Jesus spent with his friends, he said, I give you a new commandment. Love each other, just as I have loved you, so you also must love each other. This is how everyone will know that you are my disciples when you love each other. For the word of God in scripture, for the word of God among us, and for the word of God within us, we say, Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.
weeks, we have been talking about how people get left out sometimes. Or they get told that what they are doing isn't right, right? That they're not following some rule that's in the Bible. And we've been talking about how do we understand these rules? Are some of them still meant for us or not? But the big thing I want to be sure that you know is whether or not you follow the rules. God loves you. And there are some people who are told that God doesn't love them because of who they are. And that's not right. So I want to make sure you know if anybody ever says that to you, that God doesn't love you, that you know that's not true. And how I learned that lesson was from a very special song. Oh my gosh, I haven't even started singing that yet. A very special song that we heard almost every year when I went to camp at Skylight. And I want to sing it to you. <laughs> it's called Everything Possible. Keep you in good company. 
always said, that's the song God would sing, if God could sing you a song. So that is the song I want you to remember, that no matter where you go, no matter what you do, God loves you, and the only thing that matters is the love you leave behind in your life, the love you give and show to everyone. Because those are the two most important rules, right? Jesus said, love God, love other people. And so that's God's lullaby for us all that I want you to hold on to and remember this week, especially. So that no matter when in your life, if somebody tells you God doesn't love you for some reason, that you can say, no, that's not true. All right? So let's pray. God, we thank you for loving us no matter what. Whether we keep your rules or break them, no matter where we go or what we do, we know that you love us and we are so thankful for that. Help us to show love to everyone else. And remember that that's what you care about most, is how we are showing love to others. So help us do that when it gets hard. And help us remember that we are always loved no matter what. We pray your blessing on these children, that you would keep them safe and bring them back next week to keep learning more about you. And all of God's children said, Amen. Amen. Our stewardship time this week would be well spent catching up on the newest newsletter that is available um, on the tables as you make your way out. There's little stacks all along the way. Um, and there's a note about what we'll be doing next week for the first Sunday in Lent and all of the great things coming up in the spring season. And there is also an update that I included in several places, but I also wanted to highlight it today um, so that we were making sure all of our forms of communication were getting in touch. An update on the United Methodist Church's recent general conference that was held last weekend in St. Louis. I, we had asked for prayers around this for a little while uh, beforehand, and the update has been posted online, but there's an abbreviated version within the newsletter as well. There was a plan that did get voted on and was <coughs> approved by a small majority, the traditional plan, which would put greater restrictions on same-sex marriage and ordination within the Methodist Church. However, there were portions of it already said to not be in line with the Methodist Constitution that we have. So it is going for review in April with our Judicial Council and from there we will see what, if any, portions of that uh, new legislation will be approved or may be put into practice by January. But <coughs> largely, it is still a question mark. It, we are still not sure what will happen. Uh, by next year, and my update from it is that nothing has changed here in Whitney Point. We are still the same church that welcomes everyone and seeks to reach out in love to our whole community and to serve God in those ways. So you can read more about that in the newsletter or on our Facebook page, and be sure to continue to be in prayer for our denomination and for all those who will have important work to do going forward. I would ask you now to please pray for me as I pray for you. Let us pray. All loving, gracious God, make your truth known to us this day and forever, for you are our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So here we are, the church.
still a family of God working together on walking the walk as we've been doing now for the past several months and learning how to do that in the community. And we know we are meant to be a part of a faith community because Jesus said that this was his long-term plan, y'all. We're it. <laughs> he left and said, you're in charge. Go be Christ for the world. And he said, together, we are greater than the sum of our parts. Combined in the body of Christ, we can be Christ for the world. So we've been looking at who's all in the family of God and working to reconcile the verses of scripture that have been used to try to keep people out of the family. We began the series, we started with a week on Jesus' instructions for handling conflict and disagreement. In Matthew 18, he lays it out for us, instructs <coughs> us to just talk with each other. Don't go to somebody else. Go right to the person in, you're in conflict with. Listen to people on the other side. Really hear them. Try to find some common ground or resolution. And these, guide, these guidelines are so important, not just for us during the series, but continually we want to remind ourselves of this guidance. Then next we looked at, so how do we understand the Bible? What role does it play in our faith? We know it was never intended to be an instruction manual, but it's the epic tale of God's people trying to know God and live faithfully in God's ways. It contains many types of literary styles and it spans thousands of years. And its stories were told around campfires for decades before being written down. And we know despite the limitations of the humans who wrote these stories in the Bible, and despite our own limitations, the Spirit inspired them in their writing, and it still inspires us as we read the Holy Scriptures today. We know we don't worship the Bible, but it helps us inform us about the one we do worship. And Jesus himself instructed us when we read scripture to remember all of it hangs on the two greatest commandments, to love God and love other people. So then we began looking at the different groups of people who've been condemned using lines of scripture. We started with the tattooed and quickly saw that that one line from Leviticus prohibiting tattoos is surrounded by a bunch of other rules that a lot of us break all the time. Remember we said everybody is picking and choosing. What matters is choosing the right ones. And within the Old Testament we'll also find there's some rules that seem to be allowing things that we know are not God's will anymore or never were, but we now know that they are not God's will. Such as in Exodus 21, 21, it says, the Israelite is allowed to beat his slave with a rod, provided the slave doesn't die within two days after the beating. <laughs> yeah, not God's will for human behavior. And Jesus' first disciples met and rightly determined that these old law codes that were meant for the ancient Hebrews, no longer applied to them. And so we can take their good guidance and remember that for ourselves. Second, then, we looked at the groups that Jesus himself seems to condemn in the Bible. The rich and those who've been divorced. But if we remember to keep the whole of Scripture in mind, when we read those verses, we find that, yes, Jesus came down hard on these topics because he was warning us from a path that would be difficult to go while trying to follow Jesus. But he never used richness or divorce as a standard of who's in and who's out. He came up down hard on the topics, but he always showed grace to the people. 
In terms of wealth, Jesus knew the power it could have on a person and how easily our money and things could sneak up to the top of our priorities, above our faith. And so he gave us a strong warning against that. But he still welcomed the rich in and proclaimed salvation to those who did put God first. And in terms of divorce, Jesus' instructions to men not to divorce their wives, we saw was really a command to care for the vulnerable and marginalized of their society at the time. Both marriage and divorce were quite different in Jesus' day. He was instructing those with power, the men, to not abandon the vulnerable women they had pledged to care for. It was never about forcing unhappy people to remain together. And certainly it was not meant to tell people in abusive relationships they should endure that abuse. And last week, we addressed the verses from Paul who instructed women should remain silent in church and not teach or lead at home. And we saw, again, when we take more all of scripture into account that Jesus, God's word in the flesh, clearly tells a different story of God's will for women. After all, it, it was the resurrected Christ himself that commissioned Mary Magdalene as the first female preacher to go share the good news of his resurrection. And as we study scripture and really dig deeper, we can see how Patriarchy, male domination, was the result of sin entering into our world. And how Jesus proclaimed he came to undo that sin. So all of this, all of these groups of people we've gone through and really looking at the Bible, it's all been leading us up to today. As we consider one final group of people who are most often condemned by scripture, the LGBTQ community, those with same-sex attraction or some other sexual identity outside what our culture considers the norm. <coughs> so first, I think it's important that we note our normal of one man and one woman committing to an exclusive sexual relationship because of the love they have for each other, that norm has only existed for maybe a hundred years, if we're being generous. Up until about a hundred years ago, marriage was not entered into out of mutual love or attraction. It was an arrangement, either made by your parents or yourself, but it was made out of economic necessity. <coughs> And the farther back we go, we see marriage wasn't even exclusive to one man and one woman. Jacob and his four wives, right? Polygamy is found throughout the Old Testament. But nevertheless, there are verses of scripture that have long been used to proclaim God's hatred of those with same-sex attraction. Now, if the current events in our own denomination tell us anything, it's that this is a very divisive issue. So, I am not planning to tell anyone what they should think or believe about our gay brothers and sisters. But I would like to provide some information, some insights, perhaps a different perspective that I've gained as I've studied the Bible. There are six scriptures within the Bible that are typically used to cite God's preference for heterosexuals. They're known as the clobber passages, likely because of the beatings gay people still receive today just for being gay in public. Like we've done with all the condemning texts that we've looked at, we first need to understand the context, always. Now it would take me quite some time to walk us through all six of these verses, so allow me to quote 
a pastor, Reverend Langdon Hubbard, a Presbyterian minister, who said it very succinctly. He says, the Bible says nothing against LGBTQ people. There are six verses people use to judge or harm gay people, but they are largely misunderstood. He says, after 35 years of studying these passages thoroughly, in terms of their original languages, biblical <coughs> history, culture, and human sexuality, I have come to understand these passages speak of abuses of sexuality. They're speaking of rape, orgies, sex slavery, pedestry, which was the abuse of boys by older men in Rome. These are speaking of things like prostitution. They are saying nothing about loving, healthy relationships. All human beings, gay and straight alike, are to be held accountable. And all are capable of healthy, loving relationships. A different perspective, perhaps, than many of us have heard before. I personally don't know ancient Greek or Hebrew, but as I read these six scriptures, even in English, it is clear to me as well that they are not talking about long-term committed relationships between two people of the same gender. What's referenced in scripture has nothing to do with being in love with someone. It almost exclusively only talks about the physical acts, which in context we see were always done out of harm. We know historically worshiping pagan gods often included prostitution and orgies, and the practice of pedestrian was common in Rome during the time of Jesus and Paul. But despite that that was a common practice of Rome, the government that was occupying Jerusalem, Jesus never said a word about homosexuality. In fact, he spends a far greater amount of time condemning religious people who judge and condemn others than he ever does talking about relationships at all. And of course, we know, he says, the most important thing for his followers, the greatest commandment, is to love God with your whole heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love our neighbors as ourselves. So in that spirit, I want it to be clear, I want it to be heard very clearly that I am saying I understand when people read these scriptures, they may read them and determine that same-sex relationships shouldn't be approved. I think it's clear I don't have that interpretation of those scriptures, but I am not going to stand in judgment of those who disagree with me. If you say you're trying to be faithful to the scriptures, I will believe you. Because that's exactly what I am doing too. I am trying to be faithful as I read the scriptures. So I would expect we can all have that same respect for each other. Even and maybe especially when we disagree. We don't have to agree on anything to be kind to each other. Ultimately, what this issue comes down to for me and why I surprisingly got a bit emotional when talking to our kids is because children are killing themselves because of the persecution they faced in their churches and their families. Suicide is the second leading cause of death for kids, all kids, age 10 to 24. That is terrifying in and of itself. But gay youth are five times more likely to, commit, to attempt suicide compared to their straight peers. <coughs> Children are dying because of the judgment we've preached from God's church. 
I think we can all agree that is not God's will. Whether or not we personally agree with how someone lives their life, that doesn't matter. What matters, what God has called us to do, is to love and respect each other and to do no harm. Jesus is incredibly clear when he says, don't judge and you won't be judged. Don't condemn and you won't be condemned. There will come a day for each of us when we are face to face with our maker. And we will all have lived the best we know how. We'll all have tried to be faithful to God as best we could understand. Through reading scripture and following the guidance of the Holy Spirit. And we will all surely discover we were right about some things and wrong about others. And all of us will be in need of God's grace and mercy. So I want to encourage us all to study the scriptures for ourselves. Not by ourselves, but may we study together to seek our own understanding on this issue and all the issues we've talked about in this series. And may we pray for God's guidance on these issues, to be open to hearing God's voice still speaking to us. May we all work to show each other the respect and grace and love we would hope to receive, even and especially when we disagree. May we follow Christ's instructions to love each other, so that the world will know we are Christ's followers. May we trust God to sort us all out at the end, <clears throat> remembering that we will never, we will never look into the eyes of someone God doesn't love. Gay people, the LBGTQ community, <clears throat> They are children of God. They are a part of God's family. May we all know we are beloved children of God and people of worth.